Well, hello, this is Pastor Glenn from Chapmanville Community Church, and we're joining together again today for our midweek Bible study, wherever you are. Um, glad you're here. Glad you're with us. Hope you have your Bible opened up to um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That's where we're going to be studying again today as we continue uh, our study in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Uh, but before we get started, we're going to take a time, uh, take some time for prayer and um, passage of scripture that came up this morning as I was talking with somebody is found in Philippians chapter 4, uh, Philippians 4 verse 8. And um, uh, if you have your Bibles, you may want to open up to it just to read along. I'll have it on the screen so you can read along with me. But let's read this together to kind of frame our time together in prayer. Let's read this together. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, I'm going to leave this up here just for a second. Just something I wanted to point out to you. Paul says to the church at Philippi right off the bat in verse 8 here, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Can, can I have you look at me for just a second? If there is ever a time that we need to be reminded of the truth of this verse, it's now. There are so many things out there that are not true. There are so many worries and fears we have that may or may not be true. There are so much news out there that may or may not be true. Can I just encourage you? Paul is telling the people at Philippi, and I believe he's telling you and me as well as we read this, whatever things are true, think on these things. Now, he lists other things, but today my encouragement for you is whatever you're dealing with, Focus on the things that are true. Meditate on those things. Let your mind dwell on those things. And remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So today we're going to focus on what is true, and the truest thing we can focus on is Jesus Christ. Will you join me in prayer as we begin today? Father God, we are so honored and thankful to be able to be with you today and to spend time reading and studying your word. I thank you today, Lord, for the words of Paul when he simply just he, he told the people at Philippi and reminded them of the things they should think about, the things they should meditate on. Lord, in our world, there are so many things that are being thrown at us on any given day. And Lord, today I ask that you would help us to to push the reset button, that we would draw back and that we would reflect on you, that, that the things that are true, we would think about. Things that are noble, things that are just. We live in a world where there is so much, there is so much that is wrong out there. Help us to focus on the things that are just. I pray, God, you would help us to focus on the things that are pure. There are so much filth and garbage that is being flung our way. And whether it's on the internet or on television, on the cable, um, in social media, in the newspaper, or in our lives, God, help us to focus and meditate on the things that are pure. Help us to focus on the things that are lovely, whether it is a flower or a sunrise or a sunset or an eagle soaring in the sky, or a deer walking across the field, or just thinking of your love, your grace that you pour out on us. I pray today, Father, that the things that are of a good report, the things that are honorable to you, we would meditate on those things, things that are virtuous and things that bring praise to our, to our lips. God, I pray that you would help us to meditate on those things, realizing that out of the overflow of what is in our heart, that is what we will speak. And so as we meditate on you and on things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and of a good report, I pray, God, that what comes out of us would reflect you and point others to you. 
I pray, Father, for friends today and for folks in our church community who are sick. I pray for my friend Daryl and ask God that you would minister to him and love on him and strengthen him. For our dear friend Lillian, God, love on her. Draw her close to you. Strengthen her as well. We pray for our friend Jim that lost his wife a couple weeks ago. We ask God that you would continue to love on him, strengthen him, minister to him, give him the power to continue to face each day and that his faith would grow stronger each and every moment of each and every day as he leans on you and as he trusts on you. God, for those who are listening today, I pray that we would not be distracted by the um, the noise and the clutter and and um, the yammering that's going on in our world, but that we would draw close to you, we would stay close to you, and that your word, the truth of your word, the truth of your son would strengthen us for each day. God, you, just right now coming to mind is the, um, the new school year that's right around the corner. There are so many questions whether it is local or uh, on the other side of the globe at any point in between. So much concern, so much uncertainty of how students are going to go back, how teachers will go back. Father, I pray that you would give wisdom to those who are making decisions. Give wisdom to parents and teachers and school officials that the decisions they make would be based on what is right and what is true. Again, we ask, God, that your truth would be heard and be seen, and not out of a spirit of fear, but out of a spirit of power and of strength from you and you alone, that we'd be able to move ahead. Father, help us to graciously and kindly and lovingly move forward in the direction you want us to go, loving people where they are, realizing that you loved us where you found us, and while we were yet sinners, that's when Christ died for us. So, Father, we thank you for his love. And as we study your word today, may you be our teacher in all that we do. It's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Well, the passage that we're going to be looking at today is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to start out with verse 21. We talked about it last week. Um, but as we, as we did, we only went halfway through it. And so we're going to pick up with the second half of verse 21. Let's jump right into it today, shall we? But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Now, in the second half of verse 21, Paul, uh, Paul is saying, listen, what I'm about to say, it's foolish. But since you, um, uh, false apostles, and even some of the people at Corinth, since you have regarded me and you have viewed me and you've even claimed that I am a fool, I'm asking that you would indulge me for a moment and listen to me as, as, if, I, as, as if I were a fool. Um, Albert Barnes says that Paul frequently reminded the Corinthians and those who were reading this letter of the charges that were made against him. And um, he's bringing them back and reminding them of their charges. Really and truly, it's as an opportunity to humble them, um, especially when he gets to the place here in just a few moments when he educates them on all that he has endured, all that he has gone through for the sake of the gospel. And in the following section, Paul outlines um, the, the, his most important achievements. But I say that, and this is important, his most important achievements um, from human standard, according to people's perspective, of what is most important in life. Again, we said last week that this is not Paul. Paul is not trying to boast in himself. He wants to continue to point people to the cross. He wants to continue to point people to Jesus Christ. But because of the corner that the Corinthians and the false apostles had put him in, he felt it necessary to speak to them in this manner. And maybe as you'd say, maybe as we'd say, to kind of educate them and bring them up to date on what it is that, that he had endured, what he had gone through. Now, he includes three things here in his arguments. Let's look at these. He includes his ethnicity um, in verse 22. He includes his vocation. Uh, in verse 23, and then he includes his hardships. Um, it's the second half of verse 23 
and through, I believe, verse 29. Now, I noticed that there were three things about Paul's words here. The first two were observations of John Barry uh, in his commentary, the Faith Life Study Bible. Um, but the third one was my observation, and so I share these with you. Um, the first thing that we want to look at or that we want to kind of notice in this is we should remember Paul does not actually place a high value on any of these things. I'm going to say that again. Paul does not place a high value on any of these things. He's using this and speaking to them by the standard or according to the standard that they are judging each other and they're judging him. Um, and, and he's saying, listen, even these super apostles, even by their own standard, if they look and if they really take a moment and look at what Paul has endured and gone through, they're, they're going to be they're going to be left silent. They're going to be left silent. Um, the second thing that uh, John Barry points out is that Paul suffered all of these things for the sake of Christ and for the church. Paul went through these things, and if you look at Philippians chapter 3, verses um, 4 through 7, he details it. He explains it in great, in great detail. I'd encourage you to turn and look there uh, later on. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. Paul endured these things for the sake of Christ. And so while he's talking about his ethnicity and his vocation and the, and the difficulties, the struggles, the hardships, the persecution he went through, remember that this is what he went through for Jesus Christ and for the church, the body of Christ. The third thing that I notice in this is that, and this, again, this was my observation, is that Paul wasn't really responsible for any of these quote-unquote achievements that he lists. I mean, let's put this list back up here again. Paul didn't pick his ethnicity. That was something that was determined by his parents. Paul didn't get to choose that. That was delivered to him at the time of his conception, and, and uh, he had nothing to do with it. Paul also didn't pick his vocation. Jesus Christ called Paul to serve him in the manner that he, that he served. Paul didn't say uh, when he was a little boy or even when he was an old man, Today, I think I'm going to stand up and I'm going to pick to, to be a messenger of Jesus Christ. No, no, he was called by God to serve in that capacity. And I think we all would agree that Paul certainly didn't pick his hardships. But that brings us to a truth here. And I, I again, look at me here as I'm saying this so that we kind of think this through. Um, Paul recognized that God used all of these things, his ethnicity, his vocation, that God had placed him in, and the hardships that Paul had endured, God used them to shape the Apostle Paul into God's tool in order to reach the lost for Jesus Christ and to be able to share the gospel with them. So as we get into this, let's look at the first one, Paul's uh, ethnicity. Look at verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Now, as we look at that verse, I mean, it, it sounds very boastful. And again, Paul is, is lowering his speech. He's temporarily stepping aside from what is wise and entering into the realm of foolishness, speaking in this way. So uh, don't throw Paul under the bus for speaking like this. But he says, you know, listen, am I a Hebrew? Are, you, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Seed of Abraham? That, that's me too. Um, Paul was not suggesting the, that being Jewish was a necessary qualification of ministry uh, at all. Um, but as one writer said, he's saying that it provides the benefit of knowing the Old Testament knowing the Old Testament and being raised in the same tradition as Jesus. So Paul is saying, listen, you know what? Um, when you look at this, I, I know the Old Testament also, and I understand the ways that Jesus was raised. Um, today, we might look at it and we might say, you know, I was born and raised an American. You know, I, I was born and raised here in America. I didn't pick that. Um, that was that was determined because my parents were both Americans and I was born within the United States. 
and that that makes me an American by birth. But I didn't pick that, and I can't go around bragging about that. Or if somebody would come along and say, um, "I come along, I come from a long line of whatever political party." Um, again. The fact that you come from a long line, that there are Democrats or Republicans or independents or whatever other flavor you choose in your family from years past, you didn't pick and choose the political family that you were born into. Now, you may pick and choose uh, how you vote and how you stand on those issues, but you can't say that, you know, you can't pat yourself on the back and say, I was born into a political family. You also can't say um, with a bragging, uh, arrogant attitude that I was born into a certain denomination of a church. You know, I've talked to many people who say that they were raised Catholic or Methodist or Baptist or independent or um, not raised in any church. You can't, you can't take credit for that, but all of us, all of us have to account for what we do, where we worship, and, and the faith that we have, have received, and how whether or not we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. But these are the things Paul's, Paul's talking about here. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you, had, if, uh, you come from a long line of perfect attendance, and that you had perfect attendance through the sixth grade. You probably didn't have much of a choice a perfect attendance of Sunday school. You probably didn't have much of a choice. You had to go because your parents took you whether you wanted to uh, or not. So Paul isn't saying that. He's not saying that he's any more spiritual and, and we're not saying that we're any more spiritual or that we're any better or that he's any better, that he has all the answers. He's just saying, at the end of the day, that's just a fact. It's just a fact that I'm also Hebrew, that I'm an Israelite, that, that I am of the seed of Abraham, but he didn't have any choice in this matter. Um, later on, he says that, that he was persecuted by the Jews. Now, as he says that he's part of the Jewish family and, and part of the Jewish history and, and um, uh, descent, um, he was persecuted by his own people. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but you know, I'm, I may expect to be mistreated by a stranger, but I really and truly do not expect to be mistreated by family. Um, I don't. I don't expect that to happen. Family isn't supposed to treat family that way. And so even as Paul is talking about his lineage, his ethnicity, um, it, it's going to come into play a little bit later on. Paul also talks about his vocation. Look at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? And then he says again, I speak as a fool. And he says, I am more in labors, more abundant. Uh, the Nelson's New King James Study Bible says that Paul's opponents were not ministers of Christ. Here it is in verse 23, they have claimed that they're ministers of Christ. And so Paul is, again, acting as a fool. He's temporarily suspending his argument. But remember in verse 13, he said that they were false apostles. In verse 15, he said that they were ministers of Satan. So here he's attributing their own words to them and saying, you know, they're claiming that they're ministers of Christ. Um, but then he says, you know, from a human perspective, again, speaking foolishly, uh, and this is the key. Um, he says, I, from a human perspective, I'm even more so. Um, Adam Clark talks about this uh, phraseology here of being a minister of Christ. And Clark suggests that Paul was identifying them as professors of Christianity, or in my words, as professional um, professional ministers. Uh, as I read it, they might have been individuals who were experts in Christianity. They understood Christianity. They knew, they knew the right words. They could articulate what Christianity was all about. But that, that's basically where it ended. There was no faith. They, they were not Christians themselves. And so, um, Paul is identifying, saying, listen, you know, they claim to be a minister of Christ. I, I am, I'm even more so. From a human perspective and what he's about to say, Paul's saying, I'm, I'm even more so. Now, again, he's speaking in foolishness, but as we look at Paul's hardships, if you want to hear the testimony of one of God's missionaries who really was run through the ringer, we see that in the life of Paul. 
Let's look at verse 23, the second half, as he begins to describe some of his hardships and what he went through. Let's look at the second half of 23. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Stripes, prisons, and death. Now, I, I do not believe that the vast majority of us who are listening to my voice today um, have ever experienced anything like what, like what Paul is describing um, because of our faith in the gospel and in Jesus Christ. Um, when you read about Christians in other countries and what they go through, they, they understand this. They live this every day of their lives. And we have brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, we have brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who have experienced far more than you and I could even begin to wrap our heads around. Um, one, one place you can look at that is in the voice of the martyr, um, dot com. And I would encourage you to check out this website. Uh, I'll put it up here. Um, it's called Prisoner Alert. PrisonerAlert.com. Here's a screenshot from their page um, where they describe, and I'll leave this up here so you can write it down. PrisonerAlert.com. You can look it up on the internet. I would encourage you to do so. Uh, Christian men and women in Iran and North Korea and Pakistan, just to name a few, are routinely suffering because they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, there's one individual, and I read this, read about him, and um, I don't have it committed to memory, so I'm not going to try to quote it as if it's uh, something that I've memorized. But in 2016, a gentleman by the first, with the first name of Nasser, um, he was arrested in a city outside of Tehran, Iran. Um, and he had been imprisoned for forming and establishing an illegal church organization in his home. Can you imagine? Because he had a group of people that were meeting as Christians he was arrested because they're not allowed to do that there. In January of 2018, he was sentenced to 10 years uh, in prison. Nasser sent out a letter from prison on January 31st of this year, of 2020, and he wrote, and I put this up here, read this along with me. I am confident in all hardships, and I believe I will become free by him who I have hoped to, my Lord, because the Lord our God does not forget his children. So let me be bold and say, the Lord is my helper. He goes on and says, remember me in your prayers always. You know that your prayers are a sweet smelling offering to God and a sacrifice which is accepted and pleasing to him. And again, uh, written by Nasser, January 31st, 2020. He also went on in another letter and, and requested prayer for his family, that his family would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that, and that the, the spread of the gospel would continue. Here's a man who's serving a 10-year sentence, and he is confident that the Lord is his helper and, and the Lord is going to see him through. But he prays that his family will come to know Jesus Christ. You know, we don't understand the persecution that the church goes through. But this gentleman here, Nasser, he understands it firsthand. And Paul understood it firsthand as well. He didn't suffer these things because he was an idiot. He suffered these things because he claimed the name of Jesus Christ as his Savior and his Lord. And we're going to read over some of this, but I want to re remind us, pray for the persecuted church. Take time and pray for the persecuted church. We'll pray for them at the end. Paul was hesitant to brag um, about his spiritual accomplishments because he knew that it was only through God that, that, uh, that made his preaching and his service a success anyway, made it, made it fruitful, that Paul just brought his meager offerings to the Lord and the Lord used them. And I, I certainly agree. There's nothing unique or magical about the message of the lessons, the teaching that I, that I record, that I speak, except I'm sharing God's word. 
And I believe that there is power in prayer, and I believe there is power in God's Word to cut through the quick of our heart and our sin and to divide us down to the marrow and the bone that, that God's Word can use, be used in a way to transform you and me in a way that we can't do it in and of ourselves. I believe Paul realized that as well, and he gave glory to God for all that he endured. Look at Paul's account of the many details that, that he went through. But, but these are all accounted. Most of these are accounted in the book of Acts. Let's look at verse 24. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Adam Clark said um, that is that he five times he went through the scourging by the Jews. Now in Deuteronomy 25 verse 3, the Jews were allowed um, to give stripes, to, to scourge somebody with 40 stripes, um, but they pretended to be lenient. They pretended to be gracious when they would withhold one and inflict only 39. Someone else said that uh, while they thought it was right to stop under 40, um, it could be that a person as they, were, as they were going along and scourging that they lost track, they lost count of how many times they'd beat the person, how many stripes they'd given them. And so just to kind of be a little more careful, they would stop at 39 because they didn't want to take a chance on going to 40 or 41 or more. And so again, it was... It's kind of amazing, isn't it? You know, I, I, I don't like when I, when I mow the lawn or when I am working with uh, wood out in the woods or cutting trees down and I have a, a tree branch come back and smack me in the face or across the arm or, or wherever. I, I, I don't like it. And I can't imagine having somebody intentionally give you 40 stripes minus one. Look at 20, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Now I'll just stop there for a second. I don't believe that um, Paul's saying that a night and a day he was on a boat out in the ocean or out in the Mediterranean Sea. I believe that he's talking about being overboard and in the water in the deep, in the water with no boat, holding on to whatever um, floating device that was around, a piece of wood or a barrel or whatever you could find. Um, I've been on ship and I've been on ship when the, when, the, uh, when the waters were rough. Some of you listening may have been in the military, been in the Navy or the Marine Corps and, and you've been out on the big waves and you know what I'm talking about. Can you imagine being overboard and in the water um, for a night and a day. Look at verse 26. In journeys often. In journeys often. Now, of course, he was subject to fatigue and, and danger that was um, all part of life as you were traveling. That He gives a string of, of uh, dangers, perils or dangers that he endured. It was all part of the hardships of traveling in the conditions of those days. I mean, we don't think about it. We drive along the interstate and we go 90 miles away and go from, you know, where I live to Pittsburgh and, you know, in two hours we make it down there. But these folks traveled and they went through a ton of hardships from the elements, but also from robbers that they would see along the way. And so this is all part of the journeying that he did from one location to another, what he experienced firsthand, all for the cause of Christ, all for Jesus Christ, all for God, all for the glory of God, all for the opportunity to take the gospel and share it with others. He wasn't doing a joy ride. He was out working for Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel with others. Look at things that he dealt with as we go back to the passage in perils or dangers of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Again, as you think of those, each of those different places, the 
the dangers that they offer being unique to themselves. Verse 27, in weariness in to and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Verse 28, Beside the other, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I'll talk to you again here just on this for a moment of all the other things that Paul went through. He starts, you know, he's listing all these things off, the dangers in the city and the wilderness and, and the false brethren that would lie and try to beat them up. And again, we think back to the stories and accounts that are recorded in the book of Acts. But besides all these things, Paul had a deep concern for all the churches. It was a daily pressure that weighed him down. It wasn't that he was trying to take on the load himself. He just was burdened for those people. He was burdened for all that they went through. And any burden they went through, he dealt with it as well. The churches that were in his care those men and women, boys and girls, young and old alike, that Paul had ministered to and witnessed to, and many of them led to, the, led to Jesus Christ for salvation. He was burdened for when he would hear of struggles that they were going through. I got to tell you, as a pastor, I, I deal with the same thing. I'm not saying that I'm Paul. I'm not saying I deal with it in the same, in the same manner, but I understand it firsthand. I've done a, a number of funerals. And I got to tell you, while it might not be my family member that we are having a service for, I, I, I carry that hurt with my church family. I know of struggles that marriages have gone through, and I carry that and I feel that hurt and that burden and a burden for them as well. Paul's saying, listen, um, my deep concern for all the churches. Look at verse 29. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? Calvin said this, and I quote, Care generates sympathy, which causes the minister of Christ personally to enter into the feelings of all his people, as if he stood in their position so as to accommodate himself to all. When, when, you, when you look at this and you, you, you recognize what Paul was carrying, the burden he was carrying for his people, you realize it wasn't just the attacks from without, it was the burdens from within. When we see somebody that's followed Christ and all of a sudden they walk away from Christ, it, it's, it's a burden to us, many of us. And as we come together to pray and to share, many of us understand that. We hear that. We understand it. And Paul's saying, listen, what I've gone through and what I, what I deal with, when there are people who in my church family who are weak, I'm, I'm weak also. And I think Paul's contrasting himself with the false apostles who were, as we've said, they were charlatans. They were there for the money. They were there for the prestige. They were professionals, but they weren't, they weren't the shepherd. They weren't the shepherd that was caring for the flock the way Paul was called to and the way pastors are called to minister to those in their care today. I'm so thankful for the men and women that serve at our church, that, that are on boards and Sunday school teachers and even people that are sitting in the pew, that they love on the other people in their, in their pew, in their Sunday school class, the ones under their care. They, we, we care about you. We love you. And if you are listening to this recording today, I just want you to know we love you and we pray for you. Some of you we pray for by name because we know your name but there are others we pray for you by face we might not know your name or we pray for you by your circumstances that you're listening we pray for you we love you and when you tell us of a burden you have we pray for you and we carry it with you but we carry it together with you we carry to the cross and we lay it at the feet of Jesus Paul said listen in verse 30 if I must boast I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. 
this is kind of getting started into the next section but as he wraps this up he says listen if i'm going to boast about anything i'm going to boast about the things that i struggle with i i'm i you know contrary to today there are so many people today that spend their time trying to promote themselves and all the good the good stuff right going on in facebook going on in their lives and they promote it they they only post the good stuff. They only post the mountaintops. They only po post uh, all the victories that are going on in their lives. Paul said, you know, I'm, that's not what I'm doing. I'm going to promote instead. I'm going to boast my infirmities, my struggles, my weaknesses. In the next chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul explains his thorn in his flesh. And it kind of dovetails together. We're not going to talk about it, but I want to read it to wrap up with this second Corinthians chapter 12 verses 9 and 10 Paul said that he when he asked God to remove his thorn he said the Lord said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness therefore most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me therefore I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you today for the words of Paul. And I thank you that as we have this example of one who served you faithfully, we recognize and we realize that he didn't call this on himself, and it's only through you that he was able to stand faithfully in spite of it. Father, I pray for the persecuted church around the world. I pray for the men and women that are in, um, in difficult circumstances, whether it's in prison or threats of their life or they just are being persecuted because of their faith, whether it is in the other side of the globe in our, or in our own church family, in our own backyard. I pray, God, that you would help them and cause them to stand firm and to be faithful to, to the call that you've placed on their lives. May they not grow weary in well-doing, but may they stand firm, continuing to follow after you and proclaiming the gospel message to the world around us. God, we... We realize our world, our times are changing. And when we have people that can't even talk civilly to each other about masks or no masks and vaccines and no vaccines, we're not even talking about things that matter for eternity. God, I pray that you would help us as the church, as the body of Christ, to be fir firmly and fully committed to preaching and teaching and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, that forgiveness can only come through him, but that each one of us have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior for the forgiveness of our sins, and we would hold fast and hold true to that. Father, today we pray that you would help us to continue to move ahead and realizing that your grace is sufficient for us. That when we are weak, we are strong, but it's not in our strength, it's in your strength. Be with our church family today, God, wherever they are, wherever they are listening, minister to them and love on them in a special way today. In your name I pray, amen. Friends, this is Pastor Glenn, again from Chapmanville Community Church. As we come to the end of another midweek Bible study, again, thank you for joining with us today. Wherever you are, continue to read your Bibles. Continue to spend time in God's Word and let Him teach you from the pages of Holy Scripture. Continue to pray for revival in your heart, in our lives, in our lands, in our churches, in the heart of your pastor, whether it's me or someone else. Continue to pray that God will bring about a revival in each one of our lives. And continue, friends, to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. He alone is our hope. He alone is our strength. And He alone is our salvation. Until next time, have a great week. God bless.